Hi, I'm Ted Nelson with another quickie of Computers for Cynics. If you still think computers are objective and scientific, let's clear that up right now with today's plateful, The Database Mess. What is a database? A database is any systematic attempt to keep track of things. Lists, tallies on walls, card files are databases. In computerdom, there are dozens of database methods, thousands of products, all plausible, but the different methods combine very badly. And as in most areas of computerdom, the whole thing is indeterminate, absolutely arbitrary. It's just a matter of what has caught on and what hasn't. Here's the problem. It is natural to think we can keep track of things on computers. Always the dream of both management and hobbyists. Just a small problem of specifics, or as the Shakers used to say in the 19th century, God is in the details. Well, computer databases are basically a good idea, but frequently with terrible consequences and unholy mess. The term database is misleadingly technical sounding. Anything can be a database, and individuals will use anything. Everybody uses text files for keeping track of something. Everybody arranges things carefully in direct. A lot of people arrange things carefully in directories. We even put things, put information in unsent Gmails. I've heard of using PowerPoint for storing audio files. Who knows? Whatever. Corporations, too, have many options. There's a variety of choices. Key value database, trees of various kinds, relational database, object database, big table, but you can't have that. That's Google's proprietary database system where they divide problems so they can be simultaneously solved by hundreds of thousands of servers. What about Hadoop or Hadoop, which reverse engineers Google's big tail system, table system? Well, and what about Triple Store, the latest comer to the field? And how about Magnetronic Reservisor? I'm just kidding. We'll get back to that one. <clears throat> So for individuals and corporations, we have the same problem, whatever the methods. Dividing what you're dealing with into structures or schemas, setting up the system, maintaining the system, input and checking, backing it up, and then worst of all, the problem of changing anything in the arrangement. But for companies, it's worse in some ways because with big systems come big problems. Suppose you're a railroad. What do you have to keep track of? What do you have to keep track of? Track? <laughs> uh, railroad cars? where they are now and where they're intended to be and what they'll have in them when. Employees, their experience and salaries and locations and addresses, uh, schedules of trains, of personnel, of supply delivery, maintenance conditions and schedules, all in a unified conglomerate. It's the unified conglomerate that's the problem. And as the company changes, you want to change the whole setup so that it includes airplanes or restaurants or plantations, whatever, whatever else the railroad goes into. So the problem of databases is conceptually simple, but huge to do. There's no right or wrong way to handle databases. Just particular people who say, well, it's got to be done this way, <laughs> because usually it's relational database, and that's how they're used to making a living. There's a cognitive dis dissonance issue here. OK, history. In the 60s and 70s, the computer was the database. You had languages like uh, RPG and COBOL, which would essentially stick things in slots or fields and read them out. <clears throat> and uh, then in the mid-60s, IBM switched to IMS, which became the database system for some years. But they had a very big system at IBM that they didn't market to the public. It was called SAGE. It was for keeping track of incoming Soviet bombers. And it did a very good job, as far as we know, and its successors are still operating today. Well, this was adapted. It was beaten into plowshares in a very interesting way, and its successors are still running. Talk about accidents and technological uh, inter indeterminacy. An IBM salesman named Smith was on an airplane uh, with a president of American Airlines named Smith, and because they had the same last name, they got to talking. And President Smith said, uh, we want to build this uh, reservation system, and it's going to be called uh, Magnetronic Reservisor. And the IBM salesman said, wait a minute, 
<clears throat> and when he landed, he got on the phone to Tom Watson and he said, uh, could we make it passenger planes instead of bombers? I'm embroidering a little, but that's essentially what happened. And so the SAGE system became the, uh, at least according to Wikipedia, became the uh, Sabre system, which runs most of the world's airlines today. So when dinky computers came in in the mid 70s, the personal type computers used either for personal or for company, uh, it's, it all started over again, inventing ways to keep track of things. So PC write for people who used to, used uh, plain text files for holding tech, for holding data. Uh, PC file by Jim Button for uh, holding prelim preliminary sorts of databases of fields. And uh, VisiCal came in and that made the Apple II take off because nobody had ever seen anything like it. And while it was spreadsheet, not technically database, a lot of people used it that way and still do. All these helped people keep track of things. Maybe, sometimes, because of course, a lot of people, seeing how complicated it was, gave up. Anyway, what about the most popular system of all, relational database? Well, it was tables with fields people were doing back in the old days, and uh, so name, address, phone, and some kind of a table. And uh, one guy named Cod worked it all out with endless theoretical mathematical musings, trying to derive it from first-order propositional calculus, that sort of thing. And he insisted on 13 atom axioms, which he called his 12 rules, and which are now universally ignored. But he wrote a paper in 1970, which made a big impression and started people creating systems, all with the same general uh, approach of tables pointing at tables. Now, the following was told to me by a guy who says, a guy who, from IBM who said he succeeded Cod, that IBM told Cod he had to deliver a product in two years, and he said, that's beneath me, and quit. And so his, the 500 PhDs who had been working under him were at a loss. But uh, to give them something to do, <laughs> this guy worked out the, gave them the SQL system, the SQL language, which is now the universal language, for setting up databases and querying databases. So who created relational database? Nobody, because the father repudiated the child. So nevertheless, relational database is now standard, perhaps for none of the reasons we heard it, but, before, but rather because it provides a first line of defense against embezzlement. You see, in the 1960s, programmers had started to embezzle by essentially taking small differences when they divide a, a sum <coughs> and when there's a less a fractional uh, cent left over, they just uh, <clears throat> tuck it off in some special place. Well, the uh, relational database, and especially SQL, prevented this because two programmers could look at each other's SQL and say, wait a minute, what are you doing here? And that put a stop to that kind of thing, mostly. But relational is not the only way. <clears throat> So let's talk about the dirty secrets of the computer, of uh, the database world. One is simply the great variety of database systems and their incompatibility, and the incompatibility of one relational database with another. We'll get back to that. There is no determinate way to set up databases. Uh, you can have competitive layouts even if the structures are the same. For example, there are companies which give databases away to users so that the users will order their products. But two competing companies in the same field will give away databases which are arranged in completely different order and structure. Why is that? Because it's too much trouble to learn more than one, more than one arrangement of the database. I'm told this is the case in the avionics industry and it's the case in the electronic parts industry that there are two major catalogers and they each give out databases to their customers, which are completely impossibly different from their competitors. You still think it's objective and scientific? <laughs> okay, let's talk about database fiascos. Uh, notably, the poster child of database fiascos, the National Health Service database fiasco in England, uh, United Kingdom, excuse me. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, United, the United Kingdom has a National Health Service, which essentially 
gives medical service to everybody, everybody who can't afford better. <coughs> and every, uh, everybody who enters the country and gets a tummy ache. And they were going to set up a database system to keep track of all of these patients. And they let out huge expensive contracts and to date have lost billions of pounds, that's even more billions of dollars, on a system which doesn't work. And supposedly they're still working on it, hoping that maybe someday it might. <laughs> okay, perhaps the dirtiest secret in the business information world is how hard it is to combine databases, especially when two companies merge. The slightest differences uh, between databases have enormous consequences, so to reconcile the, fi the tables with their different schemas and different ways of referring to things, they may take the guys in the back room decades to catch up. So this is where a German firm called SAP comes in. Uh, comes in. If your company gets their databases from SAP, you will do it, self, eh? And they will, it will work because every department has to operate in exactly the way that SAP has set it up. Okay, well, it's very successful, and if you don't mind setting up all your departments the way SAP does it, you're in good shape. Another dirty secret, general problems of agreeing on conceptual structure. This is where, if you're in an intellectual company where they start by thinking the subject out, then you have committee fights over the schema and ontologies, which go on and on. All right. For databases, next problem, for databases to be used, uh, universal and shared, everyone has to agree, not just on the structure, but on the ontology, that is, on what the concepts are going to be forever and ever. So we have to agree on the categories and terminology for all time. Are you laughing yet? <clears throat> this concept is called, among other things, the semantic web. Of course, instead of agreeing for all time, we can just de delegate our language issues to hundreds of committees which will do a wonderful job to coordinate our thinking, right? <clears throat> Summing up, today's commercial database is divided between IBM, which runs the big iron that, through which flow the great monies of the world, and uh, Oracle, or Larry Ellison, which pretty much has the rest. And uh, <clears throat> if you're a regular person that wants to save something on a database, well, lots of luck you've got. Of course, you want to visualize, to mentalize, to keep track of and sort your life and all your... Uh, accounts and priorities, your plans, your schedules, events uh, that you want to keep track of, past and future, uh, places. Well, you've got Quicken for accounts, you've got address lists for people and calendars for schedule. What more could you want? As to events and places, well, lots of luck. And now in closing to heads of corporations. Be nice to your database guys. They work very hard for very little thanks. They need your appreciation, even though you know perfectly well you can't possibly fire them. Thank you. Turn this thing off here. Was it running? <laughs>